so excited. Welcome to this episode of the Divorce Doctor Podcast. I'm so thrilled to have my friend Paulette Rigo here today to be our amazing, amazing guest. Paulette is a credentialed mediator, certified divorce coach, trauma-informed recovery coach, career transition specialist, book writing coach, speaker, host, and author. Her new soon-to-be-released rele Better Divorce Blueprint, the book, planner, course, and no matter what card deck, which is one of my faves, Thriving in Chaos Project podcast, Best Life Ever Private Island Retreats, and Better Divorce Academy are all the amazing tools she created and utilizes to help her clients create an optimal divorce experience and the new life chapter they deserve and desire. It's Paulette's personal eight and a half year litigated and appellant experience, which we're going to hear about today, and her expertise that makes her so skilled in allowing her clients to stay in control, stay out of court if possible, maintain their dignity, create the right team of professionals from the early stage of contemplation to the necessary final steps of healing. She encourages people to use practical tools, inspiration, and her proven wellness model. Thank you so much, Paulette, for being here and sharing your story with us and the listeners of the Divorce Doctor podcast. Oh, thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. It is a true breath of fresh air and honor to be with you. Um, this uh, conversation hopefully will be insightful and helpful, and I'm honored to be here. I adore your work. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I adore you too. And I was so honored to be on your podcast. So I'm excited to have the microphone be flipped. So um, I always start the podcast with the same question, which is what's one word or two that you would use to describe your divorce? Mm, horrendous, long, mm. uh, and not what I expected. Mm. Horrendous, long, and not what you expected. Okay. We're going to get to those, we're gonna get to those and find out about why that was. But I like to start also by just, you know, people often think, I, I think that this situation is going to be faster. I mean, you just talked about the, the divorce process being long, but I always find that it takes longer also to kind of listen to that voice that mm -hmm. something is not right. So how long between when you first started having the little sound in your ear that this relationship wasn't working to when you really released it? Well, I wish I had a date in mind. Uh, I was 17 when we met, which I don't believe is mature enough or mm -hmm. old enough, if that makes any difference. Not that age is the matter. I think it's more a sense of self-study and self-understanding, self-awareness, mm -hmm. but I wasn't fill in the blank, old enough, mature enough, or any of the above to be able to tune into that inner voice. Mm -hmm. I was living a life to make other people happy. I had come to the conclusion, not um, on paper, uh, that my, my purpose was as a junior, uh, I, I am a junior, which I know for women is weird, mm -hmm. but, you know, for boys, it's like, oh, you know, Bill Jr., Bob Jr., whatever. But I was Paulette Jr. And my mother had a business which had her name in it. And my soul's purpose was or felt at the time as a little girl to live um, in that same path, right? Of like, well, this is my destiny. So I always felt that uh, I didn't really have a choice. And that wasn't really anyone's fault. Mm -hmm. It maybe was just the fact that I grew up in a family of Paul, Pauline, Paul, Paul, Paulette, Pauline, Paula, Paulette, and I'm Paulette Jr. Wow. And, and I kid you not, Elizabeth, like who would make that up, right? So, wow. and the name of the business was Paulette's Ballet Studio. So here I was, this little girl, and so my inner voice got a little bit damaged or silent or uh, tightened. And I, I really didn't feel as if I had the... Um, not the right, but the uh, opportunity to speak my mind. And when I did, uh, it didn't it didn't usually have a good result. There was usually some uh, rolling of the eyes or shrugging of the shoulders or uh, criticism. And I thought, oh, girl, if you're going to survive this, you better keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And this is of a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old. And I didn't ever actually 
I didn't ever uh, vocalize that, but it was this internal voice. So after many, many years of that ingrained in me, here I was 17, met the man of my dreams, fell in love. Uh, he asked me to marry him. Um, it was an interesting proposal. I will save that for another episode. But, um, you know, into the marriage, I realized, wow, like, did I really vocalize my um, my feelings about this? And it just felt like I was tracking along, allowing other people to make my decisions for me. And as I've learned from reading the beautiful book, and I recommend it to everyone, written by Bronnie Ware. She's Australian, so got to love the name. And it's called The Five Top Regrets of the Dying. Mm -hmm. And number one is that we live a life uh, that we assume or think that others um, want of us and not one that we've chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of how I felt. So my inner voice felt very silenced. Uh, it was very difficult for me to find the courage and the strength and the fortitude to speak how I felt. And I was very good at wearing a mask mm -hmm. and playing a part, being a dancer. We're taught to, well, the show must go on and um, never let them see you sweat and, uh, you know, break a leg. I literally remember those sayings mm. as if they were truth. And, you know, there's always some little idioms when it comes to professions. But trust me, anybody who's a dancer, a theater person, if you've never heard break a leg, well, maybe you should find another profession because you probably haven't been paying attention. But I really did hear those things. And that message to me was stay silent. Um try to make the best of it. I was all always taught to be a trooper. Mm. Like I remember those words, be a trooper. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I still am. I am an eternal Jesus. optimist. But I'm thinking but, about the break a leg, Paulette, like basically that's setting you up to say, if something hurts, keep going. So if the mayor, you know, if you don't feel like something's good, head down, keep going. Right. Yeah, I don't know if you, if anyone here um, as a woman has ever been taught ballet, but when you go on point at 9, 10, 11, mm -hmm. and you get your point shoes, they're told, well, if you get a blister, just, you know, keep going. You're always taught to just put a Band-Aid on it, cover it up, keep going. And yeah, I, I disconnected from mm -hmm. every emotional, mental, psychological feeling I ever felt, physical too. It was a, a feeling of disconnect. So for yeah. years I felt this, but I didn't feel that I had the authority or power or right to really speak my mind for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking also that in combination with this really suppression of your needs or your voice was also this need to always seem like everything was great. Oh, hell yes, my dear. You right. know, everything was perfect hair. Mm -hmm. And forgive me for my, like, <laughs> I know I normally do not wear my hair like this. And this is kind of like ballerina mode here, but yeah. the video, right? Yeah. I learned, I knew how to look the part, you yeah. know, which I mean, I still can do, you know, I can wear a navy blue suit and show up with judges and lawyers and look that part, but I can also hang out with the psycho psychiatrist and the therapist and being a birth doula and the feather earrings and the whole earthy crunchy thing. And right. as we talked a little bit about my Himalayan Institute background, like I can wear that too, you know? And right. so I, I can be a bit of a chameleon, but, and that's not to say that that's inauthentic, but there is this part uh, and you hit on that about looking the part, acting the part, feeling the part, not necessarily being fake, but being malleable, being a chameleon where you can meander through life and be um, you're just uh, ad adaptable. Yeah. And I think, you know, Paula, one of the things you bring up a really good point, I talked to a lot of clients about this, that, you know, many of our traits or the parts of us um, that are, are really have gotten us far 
are also the parts that have hurt us. So in a healthy relationship, being a chameleon might look like, oh, your partner needs a little more, so you adapt to them, right? In healthy relationships, it's adaptability. In a problematic relationship, like it sounds like in your first, that is, you know, might be seen as codependency or sublimating your needs or putting the person first. So I just want people to know that we don't want to say that you're not saying this, but that the one trader is good or bad. There, it's it's about who you, who you use them around, and mm-hmm. if you're also aware that that's happening. And I imagine in your first marriage, very often you try to do keep him happy. Yeah, I tried to keep everyone happy. Mm -hmm. I was the youngest of three, but there's a large age difference between them and me. So in many ways, I was the only child, the Mm -hmm. baby, but also the first. Like it was like when you when there's I think it's more than 10 years, Mm -hmm. you're pretty much starting all over again as a parent. So I really was that uh, peacemaker, the bridge, the conduit between the the grandparents, the parents, the siblings, Mm. and the family. And I was definitely the fixer, the, um, oh, um, the positive conduit to us problem solving. I always, and I still do, see, see, um, the question of, are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? And that was how I f- coped with that conflict internally, as well as externally. I could walk in any room or any situation um, and it's a skill. And I'm, I'm proud that I have that skill because it allows you to really read people and read a room, although I'm not always uh, right it, it does allow you to know, well, so am I uh, part of the um, per- keeping the facade going, keeping the story, uh, um, even if it's healthy or unhealthy, but I'm allowing it to continue and perpetrate, or am I putting down that boundary of saying, this isn't healthy. Um, What can I do to kindly change the conversation in such a way that everybody now is able to be heard and seen and validated? Uh, Some people like that and sometimes not so much. Right. And when did you know it was time to end the relationship? (laughs) Well, I had two relationships that I felt I needed to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. The first was the fact that I had become, uh, you know, a part of this family legacy. And it was very hard for me to cut the ties with that in the sense that it was my name it was my family of origin. It was a environment in which I grew up in that gave me so much courage and poise and grace and rhythm and skill and talent, but it really was never my purpose or who I was. Mm-hmm. I was not that little girl that said, mommy, I want to be a dancer. Mm-hmm. I want to be a Broadway star. I want to be a singer, a dancer, an actor. Never. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be Jane Polly. I went to college for uh, journalism. I wanted to be on the Today Show Mm -hmm. and like be a journalist and be a writer and work in TV and radio and media and all that. Of course, this is way back in the 80s. But um, and and there was a little bit of a like, what? You want to be a what? You know, keep Mm -hmm. that quiet. So Mm -hmm. even though I did go to school for journalism communications and get my degree in it, Um, it was still this underlying sense of, well, this is the expectation. So the mixed messages were, were tricky. So you had to really release or divorce that relationship. Yes. That was the first one where I felt like, okay, if in order to get the courage to speak my truth, I need to come to terms with this, the sense that even though this has not been all bad, you know, we always have to don't throw out the baby with the bathwater people. Right. And so it's a horrible expression. So please right. bear with me. Like, Oh, the old, you know, right. where do these expressions right. come right. from? Right. Like, right. who would even right. think of that? Like, but if, if you just let that go, but you know, we don't want to let go of the good. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we want to let go of the bad, but keep the good. So, you know, I did finally, while wow, like was empowered 
empowered, Mm -hmm. when I felt inspired and unencumbered Mm -hmm. by the burden of that label of having to live under that. And there was a long period of time, maybe five or six years between having the courage to do that, raise my self-confidence, self-commitment and awareness to self to say, wow, if I can be truthful about that part of my life that feels inauthentic, I know that I can have the skill and the voice to be able to do that with the marriage. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all bad. You know, I was 17 when we met. I mean, dear Lord, I mean, anybody, I mean, give yourself a break. If you, we don't know our ass from our elbow, pardon my French, but really I did not. And, you know, 22, 23 getting married and it, it, there's gotta be some change in the law that if you're under the age of whatever, like there needs to be some sort of guidance, education, but I truly did not understand. And uh, I did not go into marriage thinking it would end. I did not go into marriage thinking that it would fail Mm -hmm. or that it was um, something wrong, but it was just like, well, it's the checklist, right? Mm -hmm. Be a good kid, go to school, get grades, go to college, get a job, get married, have kids. Like that's how I, uh, internalize those messages. So when I did finally say, I don't think I can stay in this marriage forever in the sense that I feel that the pain of staying Mm -hmm. is greater than my fear of change or the unknown. That's a really wonderful point. I think a lot of people can relate to that, that the pain of staying is, is worse than the fear of really yeah. and it's sometimes it's about like levels of pain right we have to just be honest about it because it's hard right it's not this suddenly i'm going to be free um so i love that that's that's so helpful mm. um, that's such a good reminder just want to sit with that for a moment mm. <sighs> yeah i mean when i reminisce a bit about that the pain was overwhelming and confusing Um, it felt, um, that I needed to either keep up the, I don't want to say act, but the, the process of just getting through it, trudging along, being a trooper, right? You got this, you're smart, you're strong, you're, you can persevere and, you know, you, you've got a family and, and you, it's your obligation to, to keep trudging along. And I believe all that. It was just a matter of like, at what cost? And is it damaging to myself, my my family and the children, or is it better and not necessarily easier? I'm not going to throw that word in there uh, to, in the long run, have the integrity Mm -hmm. uh, to speak um, and set the example of living a life that is true to self and at the, um, the um, awareness of others that they too, if they were ever to find themselves in a similar situation, not necessarily just with marriage, right? But relationships, work, Mm -hmm. any category of life, Mm -hmm. um, that is it difficult to rock the boat? Hell yes. Um, But is it healthier? Depends on the situation. I think that's it. You're bringing up such a great illustration of um, that your divorce really came from pushing back on a message that you were taught, which is that even if things are not comfortable, you keep going, be a trooper, break a leg, right? Um, And that this was just another example of that in your life. And so it's such a great example of what I talk about in my book. And I know you talk about in your work about really needing to understand where these patterns of thinking have come from Mm -hmm. in order to shift, because you present, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened after, but you could leave a relationship like that and still be doing the be a trooper. And even though you left the relationship, you wouldn't have shifted, right? It was, you were the one who needed to do the work of releasing the needing to always go along with everything. Yeah. Beautiful point, Elizabeth. There's so much work to be done 
And that's where a lot of people bow out, mm-hmm. forgive the uh, theater analogy, right? But um, they say, oh, that's so much work. I have to self-evaluate and self-study and understand and um, get out the magnifying glass and examine my patterns, habituations and imprints and decisions that I've made and lived and try to reevaluate them and either put them in categories of, well, this didn't work or this did work and this might work and, uh, and, and then pick up the pieces to that. It's, it is a lot of work. It's exhausting. But now that I've done it, and not only personally, but professionally helped others through this, uh, it is, hell yes, so worth it. I did not find this work. It found me. I had no interest in this. Um, It's a matter of stepping into that experience and looking back with no regrets uh, to feel that uh, this is not... um, by chance, yeah. I was supposed to have um, lived and encountered this roadblock. Uh, and what is the lesson that I needed to learn so that I can never have to go through this again? And how do I help others from making those same mistakes? Because regret is a horrible thing. Right. That's what's so wonderful about the work you do. And I'm, I'm curious because we, I said in your bio, and I know this about you, that you had this incredibly protracted, difficult, legal um, actions with your ex-husband. And I want to hear a little bit about that. And I want just wondering, like, did you do your psychological healing while that was going on? Did you have to wait till that shit was over? Like, how did you, how do you manage it? If you're, if you're managing an incredibly difficult legal case, tell me about that. A beautiful question. I don't know that anyone has ever asked me that. So I appreciate that, my dear. Uh, I, this is my personal experience, but yes. I was not capable of going through both processes at the same time. Uh, there was a tiny bit, maybe 10% of me, that it was aware that the divorce decision and journey involves two separate worlds. There is the physical, sexual, spiritual, psychological, mental, emotional part of the divorce journey. But there's also the legal, uh, financial, residential, mortgage, lending, tax, uh, insurance, all the logistic part of the journey. And those two worlds typically don't collide. They're like railroad tracks. And one doesn't really care about the other. They're like, hey, how you doing? Whatever. But occasionally there might be a collision, but they... They like to stay congruent, but separate. Mm. Um, Maybe that's better. Maybe that isn't. Uh, My personal, uh, not necessarily decision, but journey was that I needed to deal with the decision as in there's a lot to take into consideration uh, the thought process, feeling the feelings, deciding what I wanted. I didn't even know what that was or needed. Really taking responsibility and ownership for myself, mm-hmm. understanding any deal breakers or red flags. I didn't really understand that. How to protect and prepare myself, honoring my values, mm-hmm. deciding what's right for me, mitigating outside influences, and really managing stress. Like that is. The very beginning of it. And 70% of divorce is filed typically by women. And the average amount of time that most women, that majority, who will internally contemplate divorce before they tell anyone, even the hairdresser, you know, a BFF, a sister, a mother, anyone, they keep it to themselves in this little kind of locked up oh, that's too scary to even think about, talk about, is, by the way, two years. Mm -hmm. That's what statistics say. So some are saying less, some are saying more, Uh, no judgment. I don't know if you agree, but it isn't a snap decision. Like, aha, 
I know the answer. Mm -hmm. It's this deep embedded journey of, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do about this? How am I going to manage this Mm -hmm. so that my future isn't worse Mm -hmm. than I am now? So I didn't really acknowledge or uh, start to heal or work through the psychological part of it until I initially, yes, there was all that, that I just summarized. But once you make that decision, you're like in automatic zone of get me the hell through this so I can be, maintain my dignity, uh, make smart choices understand my options and come out of this with some semblance of grace, even if it isn't a hundred percent. And now at some point you maybe are 60% through it, 70% through it, who knows, whatever, you know, we're not looking for numbers here. And you say, okay, I think I see the light at the end of the tunnel. And the emotions just come vomiting out of you, whether it's out your ears, eyes, nose, throat, like your pores, you know, it's, it manifests its way in different, for different people. So, uh, but, uh, you know, you would know much more than me, but how long is it that it takes to recover, acknowledge and heal from this divorce process? I don't know the answer to that. For me... It was a few years, maybe because I am the 1%, you know, 97% of divorces do not go to trial. That's really good news, everyone. Like, you know, but the 3% that do, um, it is what it is. You know, some cases do need to have litigation to trial. It just yours, depends. Yours was so long. So I'm just curious, like, was that during that whole period, did you, were you getting therapy? Were you getting healing or were you really focused on, which I think is so, you know, right. It's like, it's like when you're in a trauma, you're just bearing down the hat, you know, just keeping safe. So you're just making the right choices, having the right advocates, having the right help. I'm just curious. Did you do a little bit of both or were you really just focused on one? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. When I, when I reminisce about it, um, there was some therapy, that helped me get that aha moment between uh-huh. 2001 two to about um, six or seven. Mm-hmm. And then I filed an eight, mm-hmm. did not focus on anything that had to do with the therapeutic journey of healing from it. My goal was to survive. Yes. And that's to- important for people to understand that if that's where you are, that is a biological need and our ability to see holistically shuts down. And so if you are, you know, thinking, oh, I should be doing all this healing or whatever, like just know you're, if you're in the taking care of your safety, that's the right place to be. So I just want to. No, beautiful. And I don't know that I'm the poster child, but because my eight and a half year experience, which is again, the 1%. Yeah. So again, of that 3% that do go to trial, only 1% of that 3%, which is even smaller, uh, goes to the appellant court process. So I truly am the 1%. Mm-hmm. My, my divorce attorney even called me the unicorn. Mm-hmm. And this is after 30 plus years of being an incredibly experienced family law attorney. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, Paulette, I've been doing this a long time and this is an incredibly rare situation. And I looked at him and I think a tear rolled down one cheek. And I said, why me? Yeah. When I first met him, he said, what do you want? And I said, I want my life back. Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't give that to you. Um, and I was so devastated, not that I expected him to bring it to me in a blue box with a bow. I I was not delusional, but I I just, it was the acceptance that I had to be okay with that, that, that it it wasn't all bad. And I honor that. And it was, it was a beautiful relationship on so many levels, but there was this sense of like, oh my, 
Why me? And once we started to walk down that journey of mediation was not about to work, Mm -hmm. um, there does take two people to come to the table in good faith to be able to make decisions and be transparent with everything. If that is not the case with both parties, it's going to be very difficult to use one of the other four methods of divorce um, other than litigation. Not that you have to go to trial. Just because I'm the unicorn doesn't mean I'm looking for more unicorns in the farm. But um, so that experience became one in which I learned so much. And because my case became well known, I even I use the word notorious. Uh, hundreds of people, predominantly women, did reach out to me and say, I heard about your case. How can you help me? What, you know, and uh, being who I am, I was like, come on over, like, tell me your story. What can I do? And I'm teaching and facilitating for years in other realms of life, made a lot of coffee, poured a little bit of wine and listened to a lot of stories. Yeah. And I also called my attorney after a while and said, wait, people are reaching out to me. Should I go to law school? Mm. And he said, you know, you'd be one hell of a litigator. You really should consider it. And I was humbled, but embarrassed and like a little bit like, no way, I'm not doing that. And he said, no, but you really should consider becoming a mediator and a divorce consultant because you have such a unique glimpse of the whole breadth and depth of all things divorce, that you are able to walk somebody through the journey of contemplation, approaching, uh, surviving, you know, dealing with the, the process. And also after, what does that look like? Um, change and the practical stuff, changing your name, dating, you know, and a lot of women are lucky enough on some levels to get child support and alimony, but it doesn't last forever. And they don't have a plan B. And it's so sad to see them panic. And they're not able to either create a sustainable, viable future for themselves because they realize, damn, what do I do now? Right. So there's every, so I help them create that future. It's contemplation, survival and healing. And, um, what I love There's about so this, much to learn. And what I love about this, Paulette, one is what you gain from it that, you know, that it gave you this huge opportunity to help and to heal and that it was really authentically you because it was the part of you you talked about earlier, who's the problem solver, who likes to help, but it's boundaried and appropriate and, and in the right place. And so I feel like it's a perfect um, use of your amazing skill and your heart and your authenticity to be able to use your experience to help other people. Well, I didn't want to put that journey and a personal experience to waste. Although I have to admit, I did not choose this. This was right. not my revelation of, aha, I'm going to take all my education and professional experience and create a model of um, founding a platform to help predominantly couples and women walk through divorce and make better choices and create a new life. There's no way in hell I said that. It was right. this organic process of being able to look at what I experienced personally and trained in, because I don't do anything halfway. Mm -hmm. uh, once I had that initial conversation with my attorney, uh, I took it seriously. I did a ton of education, training, mentoring, certification, uh, internships, if you will, and witnessed mediations and coaching and consulting to be able to help people get through all things divorce so that they can divorce with dignity and create that outcome that they really need, but is very difficult to create on your own. I knew I... Uh, happenstance just got through it one step at a time having the uh right, right. the experience i'm wondering I, I always ask this question at the end of the podcast which is if you could go back with all the information that you know <laughs> now about yourself and your clients to that either that 17 year old 22 year into your, mm. your past self what what would you whisper in her ear mm. 
Oh, do we have another hour? <laughs> you can come back. It would be a very long conversation, but if I had to summarize, it would be, don't be afraid to be committed to explore what really makes you tick and what allows you to feel whole. Um, nobody else can tell you what your feelings and experiences are. It's something that you vicariously, viscerally, kinesthetically uh, know, and nobody can diagnose your personal journey. People are going to have their opinions. People are going to have their viewpoints and judgments. But when you truly know uh, what's real to you and not to be delusional uh, and don't we talked about that but to really look it in the eye and to know this is the experience I had um, and to get the proper uh, professional guidance uh, whether that be psychological with someone like yourself and to find that uh, wisdom that comes from someone that knows Mm, I don't know if the wording here um, knows the proper uh, journey or process for you to follow. But when you really um, allow yourself the, um, I don't want to say permission, but the authority in which to um, speak your experience, even if it's just to yourself, this could be journaling. Mm -hmm. This could really just be a process of you acknowledging and stepping into your experience. It, it's a challenging thing, but once you start that process of acknowledging the experience you've had, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. That's tricky because it's, it's, um, it's a responsibility uh, not just um, a privilege. You are only given one chance at this. And it's very important that you don't fluff it off and just sidebar it. it you have to take ownership. It's, um, it's challenging. Get the right guidance. Do the work. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, take the steering wheel. You know, be the, the captain of your own ship. Um, it's your responsibility, your right, and your privilege. So beautiful. Thank you so much, Paulette. Yeah. Can you let people know how to find you, your amazing work, all of your resources. Can you let, we'll have sh links in the show notes, but I just would love for you to say. Yeah, that. of course. Well, the easiest way is through the website. It's Better Divorce Academy. And I called it that. Uh, because there's so much to learn. Uh, you know, you know, you don't just pick up a book like a Danielle Steele novel and not to pick on Danielle Steele, but you know, like any of, you don't just pick it up and read it, put it back on the shelf and go, and I've got a lot of books here and there's my book and workbook <laughs> up there. But uh, for those of you watching the video, um, you want to read it, absorb it, digest it, but you have to assimilate it mm -hmm. and you have to um, apply it. So there's a 307 page book called Better Divorce Blueprint mm -hmm. and a 197 page companion workbook that goes with it because you can't just read the book or read the workbook. You've got to see that the two of them work congruently. Read the book. And then each time I ask a lot of questions, I know a lot of people don't love that. But if you don't truly understand your why and your goals and your dreams and your values and your desires and understanding, you know, what makes you tick, then divorce is going to be a very painful experience. If you can identify with all of those questions that I ask in the, in the workbook, you're going to walk through it confidently uh, with the wisdom. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is you just read about it and you know it. Wisdom is you experience it. Mm -hmm. And it's very different when you take that deeper 
dive and you go a little bit through beyond the skin to really uh, do the work so you can confidently walk through it, knowing that you're making the best choices, not just any choice. It's deliberate. Thank you. I, so people can find that on your website. Better Divorce um, Academy. Better yes. Divorce Academy. I highly recommend getting the book and the workbook and being guided with your wisdom. Paulette, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story and being vulnerable and being here in all your amazing glory. It's an honor. I love your work. And I didn't go through what I went through for nothing. It's to walk through it, be the quarterback, the cheerleader, the guide, the mentor, the expert with anyone that needs clarity and uh, empowerment. Uh, you don't want to go through it alone. I wish I hadn't. Uh, it would have made a huge difference. So use my experience to your benefit. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you. Thank you.